you freak. The EGLFM. Fort Worth, Dallas. You are a freak. 971thefreak.com. It's the downbeat on 971thefreak. All right, in our Battle of Texas, Mike, Roy just tweeted, Austin has South by Southwest. We is decidedly South. They're trying to take Austin from us. They're trying to take the Hill Country. And they're trying to take Undertaker and Mark Henry away from our side. Guess what we're not going to do? Give them up. Let them have it. Come and Damn take, right we're not. Come and take the Undertaker. Right. Come and take Mark Henry. You want South by Southwest, you get your ass up here and take it. Yep. <laughs> there you have it. It's a little convoluted. Let's us ask our new guest here to uh, weigh in on the topic. We have a very, very close friend of mine in studio. That's the first thing I would label him as. Uh, but that's not why he's here. So if you are a friend of mine, don't be like, hey, have me up. Because you got to do something noteworthy to come in studio with Mike Reiner. And uh, our guest, Mr. Christopher Fitzpatrick, has done just that. He is a filmmaker, and he has finished a documentary about Oklahoma musical icon Mike Hostie that will be in uh, the Fort Worth Film Festival just this weekend. Christopher! Hi. (laughs) Talk to us. Which side of this war are you on? I mean, you're fighting for the north. We've decided that there's a line straight through the middle of Texas. It's right underneath Austin. We are the north. Everything south of that line is the south and we're going at it if the lone star film festival is going to select my documentary to be in their festival i'm shooting north too okay so he's going with whoever agrees to play his his movie hey we don't care which what... means he can be bought that's exactly yeah. right <laughs> look in my movie if somebody wants to buy it <laughs> too bad reiner spent all his retirement money on nfts or else he'd chip that's right in. that's why he's back and here Bitcoin. working coin Wait a minute, is that, is that the same thing? Tell me everything you know about Bitcoin. I can't tell you much. <laughs> I used to know a lot more about it than I do now. Happy kinda... Gorilla, Wacky okay. Alien, Infinite Tacos. <laughs> Those are the NFTs he bought. <laughs> Christopher, what's up, my man? How we doing? Man, uh, this is really, you know, truly surreal. Like, having Mike Reiner stare at me and just wait for me to say something of value. Oh, story know. of my life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, is, Reiner, is Reiner dead? Is that still... Have we gotten into that? Remember the? No, he's alive. Okay, he's with us. That used to be a thing. He came back. <laughs> Considering all three names in here are Michael and Mike, we we kind of had to revive Reiner as an yeah. option. And the yeah. topic of my documentary is a Mike. Another Mike. Yep. But he's Mikey to me. Me too. He didn't used to like that though. I is that right? Was that? Did I say no? No, I don't think I ever said no. I don't feel yeah, like I've ever. I think at some point you were a little like you're like, eh, just call me Mike, and I'm like, okay, fair enough. Really? Yeah. Did I say that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I've heard your brother call you Mikey any number of times. I don't, and, and I know you're not gonna, you know, step up to him like that. No, I don't. I'm surprised to hear that. I don't recall that at all, and I don't think I've ever. Oh yeah, you do. You Chris calls me Mikey as well. Cash definitely. I don't care. It's call like, me whatever the hell you want. This is like 14 years ago. <laughs> I, was I to mean, get the show. a long time ago. <laughs> Well, Christopher and I have been friends since the day I moved here. So much so, Mike Reiner, that uh, the day I moved here to DFW, I had a U-Haul full of uh, all my crap from El Segundo, California is where I moved. Drove all the way here. Chris was one of the friends of cash that helped me unload the U-Haul in my uh, new place at the village. And then he even borrowed the (laughs) U-Haul to like complete a move into the house that he was moving into. So literally from day one, and we actually had known each other prior to that, but from day one of my tenure here, 18, 19, whatever years ago, uh, Christopher and I have been buddies. So did you all, you all ever find out about this dual purpose move Come you guys have tried it, to pull off? Come and take it, you haul. <laughs> Value. Come get your $30 that we owe you for sharing. Uh, but Christopher has been a good friend of ours, uh, Cash and I, for a very long time. And I know you know have known Chris oh, for... Oh, yes, I have. Not many live... I probably met him through you boys. Not too many live musical events happen in the area that we would attend that uh, you don't end up rubbing elbows and seeing Chris at. And, and I would have it no other way. Neither would I, which makes him the perfect person to put together a documentary about one of his own musical heroes, musical icon, Mike Hostie. Um... I wish I knew Chris. I know who Mike Hostie is. I've seen Mike Hostie, but I don't know like the legend of Mike Hostie. Does everyone who went to OU lived in Norman? Would you say almost all of them kind of know him and he's an icon there? 
he's definitely an icon and one of the guys I interviewed, you know, he's like he would definitely win if he ran for mayor. Uh, but it's kind of shocking when I do talk to people that went to school there or have gone to school there or in school. They, they don't know anything about him. But we're talking a pretty small percentage, but it happens. You know, some people just don't make it out to the deli. They go to different kind of bars and uh, he just gets kind of lost in the fray. But he still plays every Sunday night there. He has since 1998 at the deli. He's got a residency every Sunday night, which is kind of incredible. Like I compare it to, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Marty and Elaine from the movie Swingers. They would they would play at the Dresden. Yeah. 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 Kind of the same deal. You know, I mean, Marty has since passed away, but I've always kind of equated Mike Hossey to being sort of that cult hero following, um, but obviously a much smaller place. So his his statue there is bigger. That's damn near 25 years. Mm -hmm. Something to be said for that. It's hard to do. And if if you're good enough, though, people that, hey, you pick your day and you keep playing until you can't. So who is Mike Hossey and why is he worthy of a documentary uh, like the one that you made? So, Oklahoma breakdown. Uh, and I don't know, remember how much you, you know, recall. I remember you saw him at the Vagabond. Yes. Mike, remember the Vagabond? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys are both financial. Sure do. We remember it a whole lot, unfortunately. Has that been brought up on this show yet? No, we've not talked about no, it. No, we've not told the Vagabond story Our yet. bar and restaurant pursuits. <laughs> you can fault Eric Nadell for that, I think. Right? And Nadell, yes. <laughs> well, Never talk- say that word again, other than we were there. <laughs> Fitz told me, Christopher said, there's this guy you got to see. I'm like, cool, I'm in. And that's what I knew about Mike Hosty going in. Had an absolute blast. I knew nothing, and it was nothing but fun. And yes. that's like kind of the the mark of, I think, a great musician. If you know zero, and you leave there like intrigued, smile on your face. And that's what I took from Mike Hosty. But for those listening, who is he, and why is he worthy of a doc? Well, that's exactly how I describe him. I'm like, whatever he is, he's always fun. Like, if you're having a bad day at work or something's going down in your life, it's like, you go see Mike Hosty and you just forget about that for a while. But he is, and I'm not kidding you, Mike Reiner, that he is literally the best musician I've ever seen on a stage because of what he's capable of doing by himself without the help of loops and triggers. I mean, he plays drums, but it's three-part drums with his feet. I mean, he's doing two things with his left foot. Mm-hmm. You ever seen that before? No, I don't think so. And, you know, he's just drumming with his feet, but then he's playing the guitar, and he's not just playing, like, three chords. He's thumbing the bass, he's playing the rhythm, and then he'll whip into a solo while still thumbing the bass while playing the drums, and then he'll throw in a harmonica, and he'll tell jokes, and he'll stop all of it, and you realize, oh, my God, he's doing all this literally by himself. And you he, probably and he, forget that he's doing it as you watch, right? Oh, yeah. Because like, you just get lost in it, and then you're right. When he stops, you're like, all him. All right, this is him? Yeah, this is him. And so everything you're hearing right now is made by one person. And he, I'll lay out for a second when you can hear him break into his little solo. But he, and he tells jokes. So like, he's got this humor and wit about him, right? And when he's doing all this, you like you said, you forget about it. And a lot of times when you're watching a one-man band, you're kind of waiting for him to screw it up. Right? I mean, you see a guy with drums and that much stuff, you're like, okay, how good can it be? He's probably just playing a couple chords. But he remembers all his lyrics. Incredibly intelligent guy. And uh, and he mesmerizes a crowd, and he can hold this cut that you're hearing now was on a New Year's Eve in, at the deli. I think there was like 100 people. bar was packed. But he can also play in front of three people and just tell jokes. And, and he, can, he holds an audience like I've never seen before. All right, Mike, you're the musician here. I... I'm impressed by these sentences, but I don't really have any understanding of what it is. How insane is it to play, what, three drums, four drums with two feet? Play, it's pretty insane. Play guitar, sing. I mean, because I associate one-man band with, like, being in Central Park and seeing some dude walking around. I'm like, all right, that's wacky. But I've never associated it with, like, creating incredible, unique music. And that's what he's doing, right? Those who can create a full sound with just one guy like this, like this, which we're listening to. It's very extraordinary. It's very extraordinary. It's very hard to do. And it's, you know, for me, it's one of those things that I've always been, okay, well, I'll believe this when I see it. But I have seen it a couple times. You've seen Hostie before? Um, I don't think so. I don't think I've seen him, but I've seen guys like others him. come close to this. And this is him right here. You hear him doing some weird... He's doing electronic dance music, like his own version of it, because he doesn't use loops or triggers. Mm-hmm. So he's just getting the crowd hyped. <laughs> and here it comes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I can't stop picturing that one dude's doing that. That doesn't really register, you know? He's got the slide going. All right, so the film is called Oklahoma Breakdown, the Mike Hosty story, a one-man band freak of nature who tells jokes. You were a college student, is that, we're told, or stumbled into uh, the deli and yeah. had your jaw drop? So I was uh, I was at a fraternity party <laughs> way back when. I barely remember being in a fraternity, mm-hmm. but I was at a fraternity party, and a band called Heater played, and, you know, I remember them being really, really good, but back then I wasn't, you know, I was like 18. I don't remember much about it, but I do remember when I turned 21, they were like, yeah, that dude from Heater's in a different band called the Mike Costi Trio. The Mike Costi Trio had, they had a B3 organ, which I know you're familiar with, Ryan. So, I mean, mm-hmm. that's hard to find a band, you know, in college that is carrying around a B3 organ. It was a three piece mm-hmm. band. The finest instrument in rock and roll. I love it. And it, and it just, it, it'll, and there's nothing quite like hearing that. No. There's really no replicating it, right? There are a few things out there that can come close to replicating it, but the B3 has a certain quality about it that that you just can't. I mean, there's a, a there's a ceiling. Yeah, hear that? Oh, you scared me. Nice. <laughs> That's what this is? That is a Hammond B3 organ there, Mikey. That's beautiful. And and yeah, so he had a good he had an organ player, a guy that play that and he had a drummer and they just, you know, they formed a trio and they they had five albums in like five years. And so that, that little time period was right when I was just turning 21. And all my friends, we'd go out on a Friday night, probably two nights a month to go see him at the at the deli, same place. And it was always packed. And every girl and guy was dancing. Like it was, it was always fun. And then, you know, I graduated and I would always come back. And he had now thinned down from a trio to a duo. And I would still figure out wherever he was playing, I'd go find him. And then one night, in 19 uh, what was it him and what else him and a drummer when he was a duo yeah so then he had to do like he was he was playing bass with his feet Mm -hmm. (laughs) bass with his feet yeah and doing you know and then he was just learning how to do loops and triggers but back then you know it's like 2000 this is this is when nobody was really nobody really knew of any bands doing that until shortly after the white stripes and then eventually the black keys kind of made it a popular thing but when you're called a duo in 2000 it sounds like a folk band right like who's gonna hire us to play there weren't many of them no and so 2000 you know fast forward 16 years or whatever 2016 uh fox sports Bally sports uh were kind of thinning down and i became you know i was now a freelancer wasn't full-time with them anymore and i had the time to i was actually standing with you mike Soroy, in line at radiohead when i got the call to come back to work at Fox, and I had to think about it over the weekend. I don't know if you remember this. Was that at the Houston and this show? This is in Madison Square Garden. Or MSG? MSG, and I had to get on a phone call with a guy from Los Angeles explaining to me that they were going to offer my job back. But the problem was there was some money involved, and I'm like, okay, if I take this, I'm not going to be able to work on these projects that I wanted to work on. And this is one of the projects, the project, that really kind of kept me from taking that job back. And I said, you know, I'm going to do this now. It really kind of kicked me in the butt to say, I'm going to do this documentary. It might have been a 14-minute documentary, but it ended up developing into more. And then I asked him uh, in August that year if I could do a documentary. He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Sure, man. Exactly. That's kind (laughs) of his reaction. He doesn't care. He's so nonchalant, like nothing phases him. So it says he has one big hit song. What's the story of this? So Oklahoma Breakdown, the name of the film, is a song that was covered by Stoney LaRue, which, you know, people around here are familiar with that name. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I know I've heard him on many radio promos, you know, talking about gigs coming into town and Stoney LaRue, and he always play that song. And there it is. And this version that you're hearing right now was at Billy Bob's. This is the first time anybody had heard anybody play this song outside of going to the deli and seeing Mike Hosty play it. So shows up at Billy Bob's, he said, hey, let's 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 cover that Hosty song. And this is the version that blew up. They put this live version on an, on a single and immediately it blew up, hit number one on the Texas charts the, the entire year, 2007. And so everybody just thought Stoney LaRue's song. And I'm like, I'd, I'd heard about it and Mike Hosty would reference it in his shows. I'm like, okay, this blew up, but nobody knew about Mike Costi, and I knew that this kind of gave it some gravity. And then uh, I didn't know how big of a song it was. I don't know anything about Red Dirt, right? Well, so I went to a Red Dirt uh, festival called, it's called Larry Joe Taylor Festival. It's in Stephenville, mm-hmm. and it's like 
30,000 people at it. And I didn't understand how big of a deal this song was until I went to this thing. And Groobs, if you could pull up, and I'll, I'll let me set it up first. You know when the crowd kind of sings along or whatever, mm-hmm. and the lead singer shuts up and he just lets the crowd sing it? Well, I got to get behind the stage, and I raced up there by myself shooting it with the camera, and I got behind Stoney LaRue and his band, and he's like, you guys sing it. And this is what it sounded like. And they knew every lyric. Yeah. And, I, and I've always, it, it, that gave me, still gives me chills thinking about it. Cause I hear, I was doing this documentary on this guy who I just knew that he had written this song on his kitchen table and nobody knows about him, right? Other than just us, you know, people that have been loyal followers over the years. And does I'm, he get any decent bucks for this? Uh, that has been asked. And, that, and the way I've heard him explain it is he didn't understand, when he was asked about, you know, Sony asked him if I could cover this. He's like, can I cover the song? He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And he didn't think anything of it, right? And uh, and it blew up to be this hit. And I think one of his friends was like, he's like, dude, you need to get a contract. You need to get him the, you know, mm-hmm. you drop a contract and get your, you're going you're gonna to get screwed out of some money. And so, you know, it was like well into the process, a good almost a year into it when this, you know, when you release a single and it blows up, that's the spike. That's the biggest spike you want to catch, right? Mm-hmm. And he missed all that. But he eventually got a contract out. It wasn't backdated, but he got... So now he does get some money from it. But as he says in the documentary, it's not like he's, you know, super rich or went in the publisher's clearinghouse. He's, yeah. he, gets some, he gets some mailbox money from it, but it's nothing huge. And Toby Keith actually covered the song recently. but So he maybe he'll get some more money out of mm-hmm. that. So you got Stoney, Stoney LaRue to appear, appear in the documentary. You got a handful of other dudes. Are they all appreciative of the legend of Mike Hosty or like understand this because the dudes within the industry I would think would be the best people to tell that story right dude I didn't know anything about red dirt music that's why that whole thing just blew my mind like that they all I didn't know that that was a thing right I didn't know red dirt music was such a thing I've learned all about this while making the documentary and so when I interviewed him for the first time I asked him you know at his house I said would anybody in the music business who you know artist whatever that knows about you would they say anything positive about you who, who could you name and he's like oh he's like you know who cody canada is i'm like no he's like because i don't know anything about it. he's like he's like that band cross canadian ragweed i'm like i definitely definitely heard of that band mike reiner have you heard do you remember hearing that, that oh yeah yeah oh yeah and so i drove down to new braunfels and interviewed cody canada just a sweet human being, and he had nothing but just glowing opinions about Mike Hostie. You know what I didn't know? He was like a kid when he first saw Hostie, and he looked up to him as a rock star. Like he saw him on stage, he's like, "Oh my god!" He was blown yeah. away by him. And so obviously, I had to get Stony Larue, and he was immediately was yes, you know, put in, got in contact with this manager, and he agreed to do it. Uh, nobody, uh, you know, in, in, as far as the music business that I wanted to get in this documentary said no, which tells you a lot yeah. about what they think about him, except for his drummer, which he had a contentious relationship with. Really? And that's one of the reasons why he's a solo musician now. All right, let me minor gear switch into just the documentary part, because I know you've been working on this for a long time, and I'm frankly proud of you for completing it and getting it some accolades, which it seems to be getting. But you have a passion project like this, you work on it, you put it together. I don't know about funding, and that might not even be that exciting, but how do you get a completed work on anyone's TV or movie screen? Like, How big of a whip is that to actually get the ball rolling to where you can get in some film festivals like you are in the Lone Star Film Festival this weekend in uh, in Fort Worth? That's a huge learning process. Yeah. Like, you know, the first part is uh, getting it to a packaged product and figuring out what film festivals submit it to and which ones are good fits. And you have to pay these festivals to accept your submission. And then they look at it and decide whether or not it's a, f- a fit for their festival. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Is this an outrageous amount that you have to pay them? Uh, no. So, per, it's like, per, let's just say the average price is about 60 bucks to 70 bucks. Bigger ones, it's more expensive. But you add up, I mean, most of them definitely tell you no. Or they, they just they because they get thousands of mm-hmm. submissions. Like Sundance gets like seventeen thousand. Did you try to get this thing in a can? I didn't even bother because I, you know, <laughs> because like Top Gun, like Top Gun Maverick was like a big hit there. Like that's the kind of films that they're accepting. Yeah, there, like big ticket. We films. need these ten minute standing ovations for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and so the first one that they did accept it was Phoenix, 
the Phoenix Film Festival, and uh, I didn't know what level that was when I got there, though. It was at the Har- a Harkins Theater, and uh, you had to submit, um, you, you know, no filmmakers know about this, but I didn't know anything about You had to put it on this package. It's called a DCP. It takes like It's like a grand to get somebody to, it's like really, you know, precious thing you have to get it onto to submit, and it's really high file, like resolution and whatever, so... They you send it to them and then they make sure it hits their specs and all this stuff and like you know that right there was just intimidating to me. I was like, how do I even go about? I don't know any of this stuff. How do I go about all this stuff? All this technical crap. You know, you 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 work for five years. I worked for five years on this film, editing it, piecing it together, making it right, switching things up. And by the time it gets down to it, you're like, okay, now what? Right? Yeah, but That's, it costs you a thousand dollars to do this. Just that part of it yeah. costs a thousand dollars. And now you know you submit it to these film festivals. Some are bigger than others. Some don't need that. They just they just want to file and and then you go to these festivals and most of them don't pay for you to be there. That most of them don't put you up. Um, some of them do, like the Phoenix one did. Yeah. Uh, but you, you're spending. And I spend a lot of money. You know, just going around the country trying to. You know, you, you show up and do a Q and A. Um, so you know yeah. that's the first part of it. And then getting distribution. You hope to find people at these festivals that are looking for films like mine. And I've met a few over the over the course of the last you know six seven months, and that's been you know really cool uh, talking to some of these people that are interested. And then you know you they send you an offer, and then you look at it, and like for me, don't know really much about it. And I luckily had somebody along the way who does do that and mm-hmm. knows very much about it, and doesn't isn't charging me to go over these contracts. And he's like, no, that's a really that's a bad offer. They're trying to take you. You know, can you win? Do you win money if you win, or you just win a the I guess that compounds itself, right? If you actually win the film festival or win your category, then you get into better film festivals and you potentially can get more offers or like you submit it to some uh, contests where they just judge it. Like I've had a couple that I've submitted to and I've won some stuff out of that. Um, And then people see, you know, like other film festivals see that or maybe potentially distributors see your name on a list and they say, Hey, would you like to be part of our film festival? We'll give you a, 70% 70% off, and you can come to the, you know, X-Fest yeah. in L.A., you know? Ooh, the X-Fest. <laughs> cool. Let's go to that. <laughs> so, yeah, and a lot of it's just more people trying to get more money out of you. In <laughs> X-Fest, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Christopher Fitzpatrick is his name. Uh, Oklahoma Breakdown, the Mike Hostie story, the name of the documentary, Lone Star Film Festival. It is making its Texas premiere, uh, what, Texas. Friday, tomorrow? Texas. 12.45. 12.45 uh, at the Ice, Isis Theater in downtown Fort Worth. And we'd like to announce the, the Downbeat Film Festival has awarded you five dumplings <laughs> out of five, our highest honor that we can bestow on any film. It's cool, man. Uh, Fitz and I have been buddies forever, and you've been working on this for a long damn time. And to see you uh, get it done again, I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you. And uh, I hope people show up and, and check it out at the, uh, at the Lone Star Film Festival. Thank you for having me on, boys. This was uh, special. Yeah, man. And thanks to Jonathan Deutsch and Tony Fay PR for setting it up. Real quick, you want to tell Ryan about the time Josh threw a taco? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's going to take a while to get into, tell but yes, him. there was a taco. I don't know what it's happened. Okay. Mike, Mike probably made him mad about something on the porch of my old place on Vickery Park. And uh, I just remember we had ordered, I think, Taco Bell late night. <laughs> And uh, our friend Josh got so upset that he picked up a taco and he threw it about 50 yards at his car. <laughs> maybe that's it. maybe 50 feet, but it was like picked up a taco. I made him so mad. A taco threw it 50 feet and hit a car? <laughs> yeah. In his own car. Yeah. Oh, he, he hit, hit his own car. car. <laughs> oh, hit his own car. Because I made him so mad. And, and then we named well, What'd you do? <laughs> what'd you do to make him so no mad? I have no idea. I was probably just winding him up. <laughs> and then. then and our, we had a flag football team called Josh Threw a Taco. <laughs> and we finished second. <laughs> Christopher Fitzpatrick, thanks, brother, for real. Good to see you. Uh, and good luck tomorrow at the uh, Lone Star Film Festival. And if you all want to check it out, you can uh, – what's the website? It's just oklahomabreakdown.com? Yep, somehow I got that uh, domain, and it's oklahomabreakdown.com. Yeah, if you want to know more, check it out there. Thank you, Christopher. Good man.